right, this morning I I was going to start a series, um, but when we got into the prayer point, I, I will still fit it into the series. All right, it I I was pulled in direction in the of the way in which we prayed. But I want to talk speak today and also on Thursday and the least on the concept of an open heavens. In other words, living as a Christian under what we'll call an open heavens. Now, there are some people who are of a theological persuasion that once Jesus Christ, because Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead, that the heavens over the Christian therefore is permanently opened and that the concept of an open heavens is non-existent. But that will be, I mean, it sounds very impressive. All right, and it looks like you are glorifying, you are the one who is glorifying the finished work of Jesus, talking about the totality of all that God has done in Christ. But it's an unscriptural thought, okay, even though it sounds nice, fanciful, but it's unscriptural. The reason why it is an unscriptural thought to give the idea that spiritual warfare is no longer involved in the Christian faith because of what Jesus did on the cross. In fact, there will not have been any real spiritual warfare until what Jesus did on the cross. Uh, that's why it tells us in the book of Ephesians, and Paul taught this, that we should put on the whole armor of God. And the reason why he said the whole armor of God should be put on is because we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. Therefore, that scripture suggests clearly that a contest is going on in the realm of the spirit. From the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Also tells us that Peter said that you have an adversary who is going about, all right, uh, seeking whom he may devour. And he says, resist him steadfast in the faith. John also speaks in Revelations chapter 12 about us overcoming him, making use of the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and we love not our lives unto death. And finally, all right, the writer of the book of Hebrews speaks about the fact that after Jesus offered up his blood, the Father and hath purged our sins, the Father said, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So the scriptures there recognizes the presence of indeed, all right, opposition, but he says that the Christian though has all the wherewithal to be able to overcome that and to be able to experience the victory of Christ. Now he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says that. In verse 25, for he must reign, that's Jesus, he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. He must reign. In other words, you reign, all right, in order to subdue things. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith he hath put all things, it is manifest that he is expected, ex accepted, which did put all things. And when all things shall be subdued under him, then shall the Son of Man also make himself subject. So, the concept of the open heavens means that the Christian, therefore, on the earth, is making use of all the resources that God has given to that Christian with divine intelligence and revelation to make sure that there is an unhindered access all right, angels have unhindered access into his life as they, all right, come in from the heavens there and minister clearly unto him, causing the will of God, all right, to come to pass easily upon the earth. The Bible still says in the New Testament that Satan, the God of this world, is the prince of the power of the air. Now, if it gets into an intelligent contest, he stands no chance against the believer. The only way he stands a chance, number one, is to tell us that that contest is non-existent so that you don't put on the armor so that you are careless, 
That's why it says be sober and vigilant. So you are not sober, neither are you vigilant, all right, because you don't recognize the presence of an adversary. But once you're sober, you're vigilant, you put on the armor of God, and you're prayed in faith, he has nothing, absolutely nothing. He says, be of good cheer, I have overcome him. Now, in this concept, therefore, what happened was... Um, Daniel offered up his prayer unto God. And when he offered up his prayer unto God, the scripture tells us that it took 21 days for the answer to come. And when the answer finally came, the angel informed Daniel and said, look, this was 21 days here. What happened was that I was hindered by a prince of the power of the air, which was a prince of Persia. And therefore, it took 21 days for the result. All right, to come. It wasn't 21 days for God to decide. When God decides on something in heaven, he sends forth his angels to execute it on the earth. And, all right, there are certain things we, the recipients of it, can be doing on this earth that will cause the heavens to be opened up, all right, so that those angels have easy and unhindered access to our lives. Now, when he tells you that a man who is double-minded in all his ways, let him not think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. He tells us that the way in which we think, the state of our minds, all right, will tamper with what is going on, right, in that spirit realm. I mean, the first place where the battle even gets into is in your thought life. Once you're double-minded, he says there's going to be a problem. Now, the reason is that he tells us the last enemy is death. And when he says the last enemy is death, he's not just speaking about physical death. Uh, he's talking about the carnal mind. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death. That's the manifestation of death inside a believer, carnal mindedness. And so he wants to destroy that completely within us so that our minds are renewed. And when the mind of a person is renewed, then they are in position there to receive the things that they have prayed about. Now, if we look at John chapter 1, verse, I just want to show this here, verse 47 and to verse John chapter 1. All right, I just want to show a few things, chapter 1, verse 47 here. It says, oh, all right, be, before we look at that, look at Genesis chapter 28. This, this will connect it. Genesis chapter 28 and verse 11. It tells us that this was Jacob. He went out of Beersheba to went towards Haran and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. So the stones were his pillows. And he dreamt, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of that ladder reached to heaven. Behold, angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it, and he said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it unto thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in thee and thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And I am with thee, and I will keep thee, and I will do certain things, and I will not leave thee until I have done which I have spoken. Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely, he said, the Lord is in this place, I knew it not. He was afraid. How dreadful is this place? It is none other than the house of God is the gate to heaven. So what happened was that Jacob was in a very uncomfortable position, something that did not represent what was going on within his environment. I want us to get this. Did not represent, all right, the presence of God, so to speak, as you understood it, all right? This was a hard place. And so it was very easy for him to say, God is not in this place, all right? Let me look for somewhere where God is. God opened up his eyes and a vision there and he saw the ladder from where he was right up to heaven's angels ascending and descending upon it. And he said, God is in this place. It's nothing but 
the gate to heaven, he says, and I knew it not. Okay? The Bible says, they that behold lying vanities will forsake their mercy. You cannot, he says, if you keep looking on the environment, you'll forsake the mercy of God. In other words, where you are, may on the outside may not look good. On the outside, you may be in a place where the job doesn't look good and all of that. But you can, this one on show, open the heavens over you in that place. And have angels ascending and descending. And from that very place, stuff will begin to happen. The key for the Christian is not where you are per se geographically, but the type of heavens that are over you as a person. That's the first thing that you have got to understand and secure. Because you are looking at supernatural all right, ministrations coming directly out of heaven. Let's look at this again. Jesus spoke about this in John chapter 1. We was going to go to John chapter 1. Same thing here. All right. Jesus talked about it in his ministry. John chapter 1 and verse 47. Now he saw Nathanael coming and said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there was no guile. And Nathanael was blown away by this and said, Whence thou knowest me? And Jesus answered and said, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. You mean you know all of this? You said this to me? And Jesus said, Because I said this, I saw thee under the fig tree. You believe this? Thou shalt see greater things than this. And he said, Verily I say unto you, which means greater things than you saw are coming. I wanted to show him how. Hereafter, you shall see the heaven open and angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The next thing that happened was in chapter 2, verse 1. In the third day, there was marriage in Canaan, Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus was called and his disciples. And then the mother said unto him, they have no wine, and Jesus said, what do I do? This was the beginning of the miracles. In other words, all right, they were in that situation, but they had somebody. There was an open heaven over his own life. Angels were ascending and descending. That's what Jesus was saying. And you are going to begin to see greater things in my own life, he said, because these angelic beings, all right, have easy access. They're going up and down. That's why when Jacob went out with the open heavens there over him, we began to see angelic ministrations, all right, in the life of Jacob that the Lebanon Leban said, I have learned by experience since you're coming into this place. He said, everything has multiplied. These were angelic ministrations that were going on in the life of Jacob. Jesus also alluded to this. All right, the heavens there, all right, being opened and stuff, all right, beginning to happen in the life of Jesus. If we look at Deuteronomy chapter 28 you hear something god said here deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 12 he said all right the lord shall open unto thee his good treasure the heaven to give thee rain in the land in thy season and to bless the work of thy hands it was an open heaven and thou shalt lend unto many nations because of that heaven that has been opened. And thou shalt not borrow, and the Lord shall make thee head and not tail. Let's look at an example again. Luke chapter, all right? Luke chapter 3 and verse 21. It says, Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open. So there's something in the scripture that is called, all right, the heavens being opened in the life of an individual. Okay? And when the heavens are open, then you're going to have heightened angelic ministration that is going on in the life of that person. Now, everybody is qualified to have that as a believer, but the people that understand that concept of the heavens being opened and will find clues in the word of God that they're consistent throughout, what causes this, all right, to happen 
in the life of the believer. When it is open, all right, there are certain things that begin to happen almost immediately in the life of that particular person. And we begin to see the signs of this. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. He operated with an open heaven. That's why the Bible tells us that when the angel came through, he said, your prayers and your arms have come as a memorial unto God. All right? It says your prayers and your arms have come. This was New Testament. A memorial. He said, now, send this angel now. Oh, sorry. He said the angel has come. Send men to one. All right? Uh, Simon, he didn't know who he was, he was an apostle. He said, and send men there. Now, the same angel that had told Cornelius this, that angel was now operational on the earth, moved also quickly to the house of Peter to inform Peter through an open vision. But he started from Cornelius. And the connection was now made because somebody did something. So when people begin to understand this concept here, all right, of opening the heaven right over their life. They begin to have angelic all right, operations and ministry that goes on in their lives there and stuff right, begins to happen for them. Now, let me just look at something we looked at this morning when we were praying. It's, we're going to teach on this and, and some of the things have to do with your thought life, with the kind of words you speak to people, about people. These things that regulate this, all right? Worship, praise, but it's in a certain way, all right? Giving of arms, helping those who are in need. That's why he says, Nisa says, well, you fasted and prayed, but this was your attitude to those who are in need. That's why he says, your arms and your prayers have come as a memorial. You see, what God has given to the church is not that. He says that you are going to be spoiled children. He says now. Christ has come, the blood has been shed, the seals over the book is opened up so you can now understand how the realm of the spirit works. The seal is taken off the book. Read the book, find out the principles. So it's no longer a game, all right, an issue of, 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 of you know, a game of chance or, you know, I was just lucky. Understand it. Everything that I've done on this earth, there is a method to it. There were certain things individual did that made it happen. And in some cases in your life, you, without the knowledge of certain laws, may have done certain things that made it happen. But because you are not aware of the, those laws and you just did them out of the goodness of your heart, you find it difficult to reproduce those things because you don't have an understanding of what you did to make it happen. All right, so let's look at Genesis here. Just want to show this concept. So Genesis, all right. Psalm 34. Let me just show this here. Psalm 34. All right, and verse 9. It says, O fear the Lord, ye his saints. There is no want to them that fear him. Now I say, oh, what does it mean to fear the Lord? Okay, he will explain it to you so you know what he's talking about. He now said, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger. Young, strong lions, to show that it's not just your strength, do lack and suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want in any good thing. He said, come ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. He said, I will teach you. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? The man should keep his tongue from evil, his lips, they speak no God. Now, if I'm, we're going to see that this is some of the things that regulate these heavens here. So he says, the young lions do lack. And suffer hunger with all their strength. But he says, they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Then we go to Psalm 104. We prayed this morning. Psalm 104. And he now says this. And verse 21. It says, the young lions roar after the prey and seek their meat 
from the Lord. So those who are going after their prey are seeking their meat in that action from the Lord. In other words, that you are seeking something from God doesn't mean you don't work to get it. That, you see, the concept is that people feel that, well, those who are working, all right, are not looking to God. Okay, God won't do it in isolation. If you are seeking something from God, you have to put the work in, all right, in order for that thing to happen. So he says, they seek their meat, but they, there's a consciousness that if God doesn't, they, that's what the young lion now knows subconsciously, that there are days I have gone out in all of my strength and got nothing. I told all night and caught nothing, but... If I go out now, all right, with the consciousness that God is the source of productive labor, get this. So he goes on and says, he goes on, look at what he says. The sun ariseth, they gather themselves together, lay it down. Man goeth forth unto his work and, and to his labor until evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works, thy wisdom, thou hast made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Then he goes on and says, verse 20, 27, These wait upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. In other words, whether it's the lion, whether it's the man that goes to labor, they wait upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. That thou givest them, they gather. So what they can gather in is what you have given them. So you can go to God. Listen, I want to show you with a set goal of what you want to gather in. For he says, Where, wherefore, I'm going to address this, cometh the fightings and war among you. Come they not from your lost that war in their members. He says, you have not because you ask not. So whatever you want to gather in there through the labor of your hands. If you say that I want the labor of my hands now to bring in this year, I'm a business owner Five million, all right, every month in profit there. Start the thing by going to God in prayer and ask him, because he says, they wait upon thee that thou mayest give them their meat. That thou givest them, they gather. Thou opens thy hand and they are filled with good. In other words, ask God to open his hand over your life so that you will be able to gather in, I'm just giving an example now, the five million. All right? Go to him as the source of that so that when you go out, now we're going to see this here. Look at what same thing he said this, and I'll show you what happens when he sees. I just want to show you, there's a scripture here. I need to pull it out. All right? This is what we're saying here. It says in Numbers chapter, and I'm going to do a, a seminar for entrepreneurs last Saturday of September at the Lekki Chapel. It says, and from thence when they to bear, that is the well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, gather the people and I will give them water. So he said, gather them, I will give them water. And Israel sang this song, spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. The princes dig the well. So God said, I will give them water. The fact that he says, I will give you water. Oh, he has given you water doesn't mean it's not saying. He's saying when you go and labor, you will find the water. That's what he's saying. So that God will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory doesn't mean he's saying that you don't walk. Because the scripture says he that will not walk, let him not eat. Scriptures cannot contradict themselves. You are not going to sit down where you are and God will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. Now, one of the reasons that affected people in the marketplace is that they listen to preachers who are operating on the concept of the priesthood, which is that people can bless you as a priest by giving to you, but the businessman in the marketplace, nobody is handing anything to him. He has to work there because the priest is doing his own work, and even in his preaching. So when people say they give to him, it's, it's he's working. 
So this idea that there will be no work is not in the Bible. He says, he that will not work, let him not eat. He said, he came by grace. Paul said, yes, I am who I am by the grace of God, he said, but that grace did not come in vain. I labored more than you all. So that concept should be removed that I sit down, somebody's coming to meet me. Okay, he will supply your need according to riches and glory, but that doesn't mean he ain't working. He says here, gather the people that I shall give them water. The Bible says, verse 18, then the princes dig the well. The nobles of the people digged it by the direction of the lawgiver. That's where God makes a differentiation. In other words, when you ask him for five million every month from what you go out to labor, here's my target. God says, now go out and walk. What I will give you is direction. Simple. You toiled all night, you caught nothing. What I'm bringing to you now in labor is direction. Cast your net on the right side and you will get direction. So you understand that God is going to give direction. In other words, the lion that went out and got the animal, when he went out the first time, he didn't get anything. The second time now, the Lord directed the steps of the lion so he found where the, what he was going to feed on. Then his strength could now come into play. So your talent, your gift, your intelligence can't come into play if there's no direction or it won't be maximized. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. All thy ways acknowledge him. What he's going to do is going to direct your path. All right. So let's go back here. They wait on thee, thou may give them their meat in due season. That that thou givest the gather, thou openest thy hand, they are filled with good. Now he says, thou hideth their, thy face and they are troubled. I'm going to stop with that. The second dimension here. Now the third dimension we see is that he says, thou takest away their breath, they die. And God is in control of that. All right. The last one he says, thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, they are renewed. So there is his hand. There is his face. All right. There is his breath and there is his spirit. So the breath gives you life. When he breathed into man the breath of life, man became a living soul. That's not an infilling of the spirit. That's your own breath. That's your own spirit. As the body without the spirit is dead. That's your spirit. His own spirit is another thing that comes into your own spirit. All right? So there's your spirit. There's his spirit. Okay? Now, the body is dead because of sin. The spirit has life. Or if he that raised up Christ from the dead, if he, all right, if his spirit dwells inside you, he will quicken your mortal body. So it's the spirit that quickens or renews your body. Okay? But he says he hideth his face and he says, and they are troubled. Now, I quickly want to say this here because it's so important. Now, what stops a person from receiving when they have asked? Let's say now. Please understand this. You ask for, I'm just using an example, for five million there. And he says, you have not because you ask not. He says, when you ask, you receive not. He said, because you ask amiss to consume it upon your lust. So what he's saying is that the purpose to which you want to use that which you've asked for is lost. And it goes back to God, therefore, empowering you. Because he says, why come the fight and the wars that are among you? He says, they are coming from the loss that are your members. In other words, you are asking so that you can be empowered now to fight, all right? And in your competitive spirit there, to win the war among people and to be king among the Jews or to be above the stars of God. He says, there's that competitive spirit. He said, so that thing can come through. Now, that's where the face comes in it. He says here, Thou hidest thy face, and they are troubled. Trouble is, is we'll see this, it, it, it talks about this, all right, it's, it's, it's an unrest there. Job chapter 34, it tells us in Job 34, let me just show this, what it means, all right, Job 34 and verse 29, it tells us, When thou givest quietness, who can make trouble? When thou hidest thy face, who, who, can, who then can behold him, whether it be done against a nation or against a man? Now, there's a reason why God will hide his face. Okay? Somebody can pray and say, God, you know, open your hand. He opens his hand. God hides his face. And when God hides his face, it's something kindled it. There is a trigger and there is something that causes his face to shine forth. And when his face shines forth, 
all right, uh, uh, stuff happens. Now, just to connect both together, if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, or, or if we go to Psalm, let's just look at Psalm 80. And I've taken a little bit more time, but I just want to explain this. Psalm, sorry, Psalm 80. It says, verse 3, Turn us again, O God, cause thy face to shine, that we may be saved. O Lord of hosts, how long will thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? So when God hides his face, he's angry at something. And he's angry about the usage of what his hand has given to the people. So he judges that by hiding his face. Now, that's his anger at the usage, and I will show this. So he hides his face. That's why he says, the rich man's field brought plentiful, and then he said, I'm going to build bands. And God says, this day your soul will be required. So God hid his face from his soul, and the soul gets so troubled. And the wicked, the Bible says, won't have peace. And peace is the bigger blessing than anything on the outside. So he says, cause thy face. I says, he says this, all right, um, the Lord of hosts, will thou be angry? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears and gives them tears to drink in great measure. Thou makest us a strife to our neighbors, our enemies laugh. Turn to us, O God, cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. Now, I'll just close what causes it. So you don't, all right, make this mistake. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And some of you might say, well, I'm in a place where I don't know what's going on in my life. There's no direction. The heaven looks closed. This is what caused it. Um, this, this is exactly what caused it. Deuteronomy chapter 8 here and verse 16. It says, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna? There was a time in your life, let's say, you were in wilderness, you were being fed with manna. Let's just say that. All right? You, you have been sustained maybe even by other people. People were helping you. They were the support structure in your life. Which thy fathers knew not, that he may humble thee, that he may prove thee to do thee good in the latter end. And thou say in thy heart, my power and my might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. When it was his hand. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant. That's why he did it which he swore to thy fathers as it is this day. And if it shall be that thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify to you this day. God says, listen, after I open my hand, you are being supported. I wanted to show you by manner. People support it. People, you know, and all of that. You now come to a place where his hand finally comes through on your own behalf. And stuff begins. I'm sure how to, how to change. You see, it's not, God kept, as told me over the last few weeks, he said, nothing is hard if you understand it. He said, look, it's very simple. Where people are missing it, these things are simple. He says, we did it. No matter how small. He that is faithful in the little. Even if it's little. If five loaves and two pieces of fish I gave the person with my hand, now I want to watch that person. Because direction is, a, is an issue of his face. When he says it causes his face to shine, he directs your steps. So when you go to him and say, God, he, he, he shows you how you should go by causing his face to shine. And you take those steps. And what happens is you find that particular thing. And things begin to happen. If he withdraws his face, then you have what is called confusion of faces. Now, the next step was the multiplication from a position of rest, that which the hand of God brought in the initial place. But because of that, and you see that his wrath gets kindled. What, what's there? Romans chapter 1 tells us what gets his wrath kindled. He says here, all right? It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness? What is it? For that which may be known of God is manifest in them, God showed it to them. 
for the invisible things of him are being seen. Now, verse 21, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imagination, all right, and their foolish hearts darkened. In other words, darkness comes in, and you create in the imagination, the foolishness, you start making wrong moves. That's why Daniel, sorry, um, what's his name? I'll just the final scripture. In chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, he wrote a letter to us. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, king unto all people, I thought he'd go to show the signs and wonders that the high God wrought towards me. How great are the signs and wonders? He said, I had a dream. I was in power. I had a dream. I said, I was, he didn't know God, but God was helping him. He said, in that dream, I became a tree and all of that. From time, I was cut off. He said, and my stump was left in, in the ground until you know that the heaven thought rule. And the scripture came and said, all right, he said, and at the end of my days, in verse 34, I lifted up my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned, which means the method of getting things done returned when I looked. And I blessed the most high God. So he realized that, look, first of all, I give you praise after the five minutes coming. I give you thanks and I worship you for this. Then the face of God shines upon your heart. Because that must never go. There is nothing on the outside you may have. You must never, for it becomes idolatry, sacrifice it. Even if you have the, look, you know, when you don't have, you'll be asking God for direction. When you have, when you have. Let me, let me tell you something here. that I, I Just to show you, and I'll close with this. I mean, Bishop Oedipo says this. All right. He bought a private jet, millions of dollars. And as the jet arrived in Lagos, God told him, you are not allowed to travel in this jet outside this country until I give you the authorization to do that. Four years now, he hasn't left. Now, when you, you see, God can't bless you to that level if that thing, you can't look at his face again. Uh, you get what I'm saying here? All right? You know, it, it, it's not a question of you, he, whether oh, you, you can't get a visa, you can't get... That's not, he has the means to get anything he wants to get. But he's still looking at the face of God. And that's why the wrath of God doesn't get kindled over what you're doing with your hands. So, his hand, but just know his face is superior to that. Because... When you ask him to bless you with his hand, he shows you his face that directs you so that the hand, you will find where the hand is. Don't ever stop beholding the face of God. Don't. All right? No matter how much the hand of God has blessed you in life, no matter. Don't let pride come into your heart. Remember, just think, and the only way you can keep yourself humble is you always go back to the days when you were being fed by manna. When it wasn't by your own labor you were getting things, but you were being fed by manna. That means you are just being sustained. If you don't go back there and realize what you'll be showing out there is fullness of self. There are times I go to God yesterday and I remembered in worship when I was confused about certain things I, I mean I went back to those dark places there when I was confused stage I didn't even know whether the church would work or anything and none of that and you go there alone with God when you were you were unsure you were uncertain and thank him and you perceive and feel that it was the entrance of his spirit into your affairs that brought you out. Because you had the same brain, the same thing there, but the entrance of his spirit. And when you recognize that, you wear that and you carry that.